Hi everyone, thank you for joining Edelbrum PIT grad seminar today. Today we have two speakers. Our first speaker is Elisa Bella. Our uh, university is University of Oregon. She will be talking about leaps of Markov triples mod P. And our second speaker is Shushmita John. She's from University of Pittsburgh. She will be talking about slow negative feedback enhances robustness of a square wave brushing. So first speaker, Elisa, uh, you can go ahead. Great, thanks so much. Uh, so thanks everyone for coming. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about bounding lifts of Markov triples mod P. Um, this is joint work with uh, Alina Fuchs and Linnell Yi. Okay, so first of all, let me give you um, the setup. So uh, the Markov surface is uh, going to be defined to be these affine surface um, defined by this equation x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared is 3x1, x2, x3. And then the Markov triples are just the integer solutions to this equation. So the integer points on this surface. Um, these triples have been used to study um, uh, lots of things in many different fields. So originally Markov used these to study rational approximations in quadratic forms in the 1800s. Um, later on, Cohen used these to study uh, free groups on two generators in the 1970s. Um, also around that time, interestingly, uh, Herzebrook and Xavier um, used these triples to study uh, the signature of certain four-dimensional manifolds, so something uh, fairly far outside of number theory. And more recently, um, these triples were used as, uh, were proposed as a, a way to produce cryptographic hash functions. So this was proposed by uh, Kristen Lauder and a team at Microsoft. Um, okay, so, uh, so that's what the Markov triples are and we're sort of interested in learning what's going on uh, with these points. And so this is how um, these points are, or I guess what's known about them. Um, so, what you do is you define this group, which we'll call the Vieta group. We'll denote this by gamma. Um, this will be the group of affine morphisms. So this is just the elements of the group are going to act on your triples in some way. And it will be generated by uh, these sigma ij's will be just permute the coordinates. And these ri's will be the Vieta involutions, which I'll define for you a bit later. So it's well known that if you look at the orbit of 111 under the action of gamma, then you get all of the positive integer uh, Markov triples. So all of the positive integer solutions uh, to your Markov surface. Um, and it's conjectured that the same is true mod P. So if you think instead of as gamma acting on the mod P points and you look at the orbit under 111, it's conjectured that you get all of the non-zero mod P points. Okay. So in 2016, uh, Bourguin, Gambert, and Sarnak showed that strong approximation holds in most cases. So unless p squared minus one has many prime divisors. Um, and then more recently, uh, just a couple of years ago, William Chen using totally different methods showed that strong approximation holds for all but finitely many primes. So it's expected this always holds and we've gotten uh, most of the way there. Okay, so what I wanna observe is the following. So strong approximation actually tells us that if we take any of our mod P points, um, well, strong approximation says that um, the mod P points can be obtained by some element of gamma acting on one, one, one. Well, if you think of that element of gamma now acting on the integer points, then that exactly will give you a lift of your mod P point. So strong approximation tells us actually that the integer points subject onto the mod P points, which is sort of an unusual property. And so this leads to the question, um, given a prime P where strong approximation does hold and some mod P point, uh, we would like to know what the size of the smallest lift is. So there are possibly, well, there are lots of lifts of your mod P point, and we wanna know which one has uh, coordinates with smallest size. Okay. So uh, why would we want to know this? Well, first of all, this sort of just tells you something about the arithmetic structure of Markov triples. If you know the first time um, that you get a mod P point um, or that you come, if you know the first uh, lift of a mod P point, then you sort of know how your integer points collapse down modulo P. Um, and then also this application I mentioned on cryptographic hash functions one means of attack um, that was proposed 
uh, depends on how uh, challenging or easy it is to lift your uh, mod piece solutions. Um, okay, so this is the question we'll be focusing on in this talk. Um, and let me go ahead and just give you the results that we have and say a couple of things about them. Um, so uh, first of all, let me be a bit more formal. If we have a Markov triple um, x1, x2, x3, so this is some solution to the Markov equation. Um, by size, I mean the largest of these three coordinates. And so what we've been able to show so far, so this is a paper we're working on writing up right now, is the following. So first of all, if we have a prime P where strong approximation holds and some mod P point, and I'm going to let X tilde be a minimal lift. So it's going to be a lift of X with smallest possible size. Then we can upper bound the size of that lift uh, as follows. So it's upper bounded by three epsilon to this power. And this power um, depends on P. So it's exponential in P and then you have a this doubly exponential piece where this T is the number of uh, divisors of P squared minus one. Okay, um, so this is sort of the first upper bound we could find. And then uh, our second result uh, is um, similar. So we're going to get another upper bound for the size of our smallest lift. It's gonna look like some three epsilon to some alpha P. Um, but here, the um, conditions of this theorem work for any prime P, not just where um, strong approximation holds. Um, and there are going to be no conditions on my point X that I'm trying to lift. Um, back in theorem one, my point X had to satisfy some conditions, which I'm just going to compress for the sake of time. Um, okay, so in the second theorem, this upper bound depends on um, these values, H of P and V of P, that I'll talk about a bit later. Um, but it's conjectured that these values are actually independent of P, and so this uh, it is expected that this would give a uniform upper bound. Okay, so great. So for uh, the rest of this talk, my plan is to sort of give you the ideas for, for what's involved in the proof of these two theorems. So how did we get these two bounds? Um, and then in the last few minutes, I'll tell you a bit about ongoing work. Um, so these upper bounds we obtained are pretty large. They're both uh, doubly exponential. Um, and we think that those bounds can improve um, on average or perhaps with high probability. So I'll say a few things about that. Okay, so uh, first of all, let me tell you um, about these Markov mod P graphs. And this is sort of uh, the way that we study these bounds. Um, Okay, so a few slides ago, we defined the Vieta group gamma to be the group generated by permutations and Vieta involutions. So I'm not going to say too much about this, but this is what specifically these would do to the elements. Um, it's classically known that all Markov triples with positive increasing coordinates appear in the Markov tree. So this picture here is what you would see if you went and like looked on Wikipedia for Markov triples, you would see this tree. Um, so these alpha one, alpha two are just special elements of the Vieta group. And if you uh, apply these elements to one, 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 well, if you apply any three of these elements to one, 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 you get one, one, two, and the same for the next point, but then you start branching out and uh, you get this infinite tree. Um, okay, so what Bergen, Gebert, and Sarnak did is they said to show strong approximation, they defined some uh, different type of graph um, and they aimed to show that that graph is connected. So to define that graph, they defined these, uh, they used different elements of gamma. So instead of this alpha one, alpha two, they define these elements that they call the rotations. So rotation one, rotation two, rotation three will be defined by uh, some Vieta move followed by a permutation. Um, and then they define the Markov mod P graphs I'm calling this the BGS style Markov mod P graphs because uh, different people use different elements to, to generate these graphs. So these will have um, vertex set uh, equal to just the non-zero mod P points. Um, and then the edges will be um, at every vertex, you'll have uh, one of the three rotations uh, coming out of it. So, okay, so here you have your point X and you have three edges coming out of that point for the three rotations. 
And so what Borgang, Gebert, and Zarnak do is they show that this graph I've drawn here is uh, connected. Um, so if I draw all of the points here and these three edges going out, I want to know all of the points are connected by elements of the Vieta group is, is my goal for strong approximation. Um, so they show this works almost all of the time. Um, and uh, actually, more is conjectured about these graphs. It's actually conjectured that these graphs form an expander family. And uh, this is sort of the motivation for our second theorem that I'll, I'll speak more about a bit later. Okay. All right. So given these graphs, what is our strategy to find lifts? Um, so here I've drawn some pictures to sort of give you a sense of what's going on here. So our strategy is um, if we have some point, some um, mod P point, uh, which is one of the vertices in the Markov mod P graph, so I've written it here, um, then uh, if the Markov mod P graphs are connected, which they should be a strong approximation holds, then we should be able to find a path between 1, 1, 1 and our point X. Okay, so maybe let me call that path gamma. And this path gamma is, uh, you know, some combination of uh, rotations. So you have, uh, you know, you've applied rotations, some different rotations, some number of times to get from 1, 1, 1 to X. And what you can do is you can take this path gamma and you can now think of that as an element of capital gamma, where gamma is now acting on the integer points. Um, and this gives you your lift. So, you know, maybe you did rotation one and then rotation three and then a few different rotations and ended up at this point X. Well, this should be a lift of uh, your point, or sorry, you get this point X tilde, that should be the lift of your point X um, from the Markov mod P graph. Okay, so um, there are, uh, so this is how we get lifts, and there are going to be lots of paths between 1, 1, 1 and X, and we want to find a good path somehow. <laughs> so uh, let me tell you what is a good path for us when we are concerned about uh, the size of our lifts. Um, okay, so how do our lifts grow? Well, uh, uh, me and my authors made this observation that um, actually, if you look at um, any of these points, any of your Markov triples, and you apply just one of the rotation n times, then what you end up getting is, well, one of your coordinates stays fixed, and the other two coordinates are consecutive terms in some order two linear recurrence sequence. The sigma here is just maybe the coordinates got permuted. Um, and this is nice because we know exactly how linear recurrent sequences grow. They grow exponentially, and you can say uh, a lot of explicit things about recurrent se linear recurrent sequences. So this leads to this lemma um, that if we look at the size of a point, which is obtained from 1, 1, 1 by applying some number of these rotations, then this is upper bounded by 3 epsilon to this power. So this is where the 3 epsilon was coming from in our results. And uh, this power here, so this is uh, this S here is the number of different rotations you had to switch between. And then these capital NIs are lowercase NIs plus one. And that's the um, amount of time you spend on a single rotation. So uh, we think that this upper bound is the correct upper bound, meaning that uh, we think there is a similar lower bound. This is just a detail we're working out right now. <laughs> so I don't want to write something incorrect. Um, so what this means is that the size of these points, um, how do they grow? Well, switching between different rotations is going to give you doubly exponential growth in the size of your lift. And traveling along one rotation contributes just exponentially. So when we're looking for paths from 1, 1, 1 to our point X, we would like to find paths where, well, we want them to be as short as possible because the longer you travel, the larger the size of your lift is going to grow. But we also want to make as few switches between these rotations as possible. So that's sort of our goal to get good upper bounds. Um, and so uh, we have two approaches to this. Neither of them uh, achieve the best possible um, path, but uh, they give us upper bounds nonetheless. So here's the idea for the first theorem. So the first theorem uses um, this paper of Borgen, Gambert, and Sarnak, 
actually in this paper, they construct a path uh, between any two points algorithmically. And so if you read this paper carefully, you can figure out how to travel from any point back to 111. So what they do is, um, and I'll just briefly summarize this, what they do is they um, look first at the points uh, where you have, where these points have largest possible orbits under a single rotation. So if you look at this point X in here, and you look at the three rotations, and you think, how long can I stay along this rotation until I get back to a point I've already been at? Um, if that's as large as possible, we're going to say that point is in the cage. <laughs> and so in the BGS algorithm, they say that points in the cage, to get from points in the cage back to 111, you only need to switch between rotations at most three times, which is really good. Um, and for other points that perhaps have smaller orbits under a single rotation, they show that you need to switch between rotations at most um, tau of p squared minus one times. So this is the number of uh, positive divisors of p squared minus one. Okay, so, um, so I'll just scroll back to the first theorem to show you where things are showing up. Um, so this um, tau is appearing from when you have points outside of the cage, um, and then this fifth power here is actually the three switches you needed to make in the cage plus one to get in the cage um, from one, one, one and the other direction. Um, and then these things in the base here are uh, the like size of, of certain orbits. So um, that's sort of very vaguely what's going on with this theorem. Um, back to where I was a second ago. Okay. Um, so what's nice about using the BGS algorithm is that when you don't have too many divisors, when P squared minus one doesn't have too many divisors, this gives you a good bound on the number of times you have to switch between rotations, which is nice because that contributes doubly exponentially in growth. The issue with this algorithm is that uh, the steps um, in this paper are completely non-constructive. So you have to assume um, that you are on a single orbit for as long as you possibly can be. So we need to assume possibly very long path lengths. Um, the other downside is this works for most primes P and points X, but not all of them. There are certain conditions on X and this only works for primes P where strong approximation is known to hold. Um, okay, so, so that's how you can get bounds with these paths from the BGS algorithm. The idea is that you have possibly long path lengths, but small numbers of switches. The other theorem does exactly the opposite. So what if instead we get from 111 to our point that we're trying to lift as fast as possible and assume that we needed to make as many uh, bad moves, so as many switches between rotations as possible. And so we can get a bound on this by using the following lemma. So uh, this is uh, true for any collection of finite non-empty graphs, which I'm calling GI. Um, uh, for any such collection, there's an upper bound on the diameter of the graph. Uh, so this is like the longest, shortest path between any two points. Um, so your upper bound depends on the number of vertices in your graph. And then these um, invariants, uh, V and H, so V is uh, the maximum valency. So this is the maximum number of edges at any vertex. And um, H is the expansion constant of your graph, which I won't define here, but the idea is that it sort of measures how connected your graph is. Okay, so um, for Markov mod P graphs, it's, uh, we know the number of points. Um, the number of points are exactly just uh, the number of mod P points. And it's known that that is p squared plus or minus 3p, where the sign here depends on uh, whether p is 1 mod 4 or not. Um, and it's expected that uh, the maximum valency and the expansion constant um, are, uh, so this is the maximum valency is upper bounded and the expansion constant is lower bounded by constants independent of p. And uh, so in other words, this is saying, so that is, it's conjectured that the Markov mod P graphs form an expander family. 
Uh, so this is exactly what it means to be an expander family. Okay, so um, using this lemma then, uh, the proof of theorem two just says, well, to find your lift, take just the shortest path in your graph from one, one, one to X uh, to the point you're trying to lift. And um, well, the length of that path certainly is going to be smaller than the diameter of the entire graph. And then you can get upper bounds on this length by using the bound in uh, this lemma uh, I had written on the previous slide. Um, and then what you need to do for the upper bound is assume that you take basically the worst route possible. So you know how long you need to travel, uh, but our upper bounds assume the worst possible route. So assume you switch between rotations a maximum number of times, and then that's how you get this um, second result, uh, which I'll just scroll back up to here. Um, so you can see the expansion constant and maximum valency showing up in the exponent in this way. Um, okay, so you apply that with our with our key lemma to, to get this theorem. Okay. Um, so, so those are the bounds we have so far, the two different possible paths we know how to construct in the Markov mod P graph. Um, both of these upper bounds are still quite large. Um, so what are we expecting to do next? Uh, so, sorry, this slide is a little bit busy. Um, okay, so what we expect to do next. Um, so first of all, in the BGS algorithm, um, what if you recall that um, our bounds are sort of best in the cage. So our bounds are best in the cage uh, because one, when you're in the cage, you only need to switch between three uh, different rotations. Um, and so one thing you can ask is how likely is it that the point that you're trying to lift is actually in the cage to start with? Um, and this is kind of a reasonable question to ask because of the following lemma. So there's this lemma that says that your Markov triple is in the cage. Um, if a root of this polynomial, t squared minus 3xi t plus 1, generates either fp cross or fp squared cross, depending on um, some certain congruency conditions about your point xi. Um, and so your, your question is, does it occur, is it the case that a root of this polynomial generates these finite groups with high probability ever? Um, okay, so we don't know. But um, for example, you, if you take just a randomly chosen point, let's just say an FP cross, and you ask what's the probability that that generates FP cross, well, that's going to be the number of points that could generate. That's uh, the number of uh, things relatively prime to P minus one divided by the number of things in the group. Um, and so if P minus one doesn't have many divisors, meaning that it has lots of things that are relatively prime to it, then this ratio is large. Um, so it seems like you have high probability um, when P minus one doesn't have too many divisors. Um, and so the question is, is it just as likely or similarly likely for a, point, for a root of this polynomial to generate FP cross as it is for any just randomly chosen point? Uh, so, so this is something we're thinking about right now. Um, the second way that we can possibly improve this so this would be an improvement on our bounds with high probability, perhaps. The second way we might be able to improve this is on average. So going to the path we created by taking just shortest paths in the Markov mod P graph. Um, so uh, when we lifted that path up and, and got our lift, um, what we did is we assumed that you took the worst possible route. So we know an upper bound for the length of the path but we said, okay, for our upper bound, suppose you switch between rotations a maximum number of times, which gives you doubly exponentially exponential growth uh, in your upper bound. And it seems uh, plausible that um, that doesn't happen so often. <laughs> so a question you can ask is, how are the sizes in this uh, lifted Markov mod P graph distributed at level L? Um, is it the case that you have points that grew doubly exponentially quite often, or does that not happen very often, in which case we could improve our upper bound um, on average? Uh, okay, so um, that's all I have to say, so I'll stop there. Thank you for listening.
Um, <clears throat> thank you, Elisa. Let me...